Uh, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 1. Actually, I'm excited about chapter 2. I'm jumping ahead. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse number 12. We looked at several verses last week. We'll dive into the rest, I hope, and the rest of these words uh, this morning. And also, two more folks to recognize that are uh, EMTs with us today. Jesse and Jay Riles. Jay Riles is a firefighter. And Don Massengale uh, also is a firefighter. Uh, in our church family. So we want to leave them out as well. We're thankful for these folks and their service as well. There's Alyssa. I already did Alyssa, but she's back there. Alyssa, wave at us. We love Alyssa. Alyssa gets us out of the parking lot. We'd be there for days if it weren't for Alyssa. So thank you, Alyssa, especially like today. She's going to sweat for the glory of God today in 90 degree heat. But Alyssa, we, we said it earlier, we're thankful for you and for all of our law enforcement folks. And thank you for being out last night at 3 o'clock in the morning searching for these uh, men and ladies that will face justice. And we're thankful for you guys. So thank you, Alyssa, for being here this morning. Um, also, let me remind you of two things while you're turning your, in your Bibles. Um, first of all, our block party originally is scheduled for Sunday night. This coming Sunday night has been postponed. Um, we are still looking for the right location. Um, I don't know other what to tell you. Then we're going to continue to pray. And we're going to put into practice Acts chapter 1. And we're going to pray and trust God to show us what our next steps are. We just had a difficulty finding a location that's in our target neighborhood and so we're praying about either a, a property we've talked to somebody about that may open up. Or if the Lord closes all those doors, we don't have a spot. We're going to go to another neighborhood and find somewhere else. If that was perhaps was God's plan too. So would you continue to pray with us? And we'll be able to discern where that is. And uh, our plans are still to launch a Backyard Bible Club somewhere on Tuesday, June the 9th, the Lord willing. In the meanwhile, you can get involved with the reading bus uh, that goes out to both these neighborhoods as well on Wednesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. That continue that through the summer. You can also be a part of that. We were able to go to the one in our Target neighborhood uh, this week. And nobody from the neighborhood was there yet, but we're certainly anticipating that uh, this summer. So just be aware of that. And also, if you have in particular school uniforms of primary school age, um, kindergarten, first or second grade, maybe in third grade it could stretch, or fourth grade perhaps, um, you can bring others from that and we'll probably pass them on to the task force. But if you have uniforms for those younger ages, would you please be bringing those over the next several Sundays together? We're going to be getting all those things together for the summer and our plans for what we're going to do for the fall for families. Uh, we're hoping to do clothes and shoes and um, uh, backpacks and um, school supplies for some target families that we've identified and also the, the, the food backpacks as well. We'll continue that. We're actually going to continue that in the summertime. We're going to let folks come and pick up their stuff on Fridays in the morning from the church office. So we're going to continue to feed those. We haven't run out to 31 uh, children we're feeding every single weekend. Um, and so if you want to be a part of that ministry, you certainly can. You can see J.R. Wren, he'll help you get plugged in there. But if you can bring those school uniforms that maybe the kids have outgrown and they don't have holes in the knees, you know, things like that. Even shoes. Sometimes your kids wear shoes for a month and they outgrow them because... They put miracle Grow on their feet, I think, or something, I don't know, or on their legs. They grow. Maybe they outgrow them quickly. Just bring those items here, and uh, we'll be sure to collect them and work on those this summer. Well, Acts chapter number 1. I want to continue where we left off last week. And the, the ending uh, where we left off, if you remember from Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 11, where Jesus has ascended, gone to heaven, right? And he's left his disciples with instructions to stay in Jerusalem. Let me just review just from your outline last week just quickly. We talked about the way of God. We kicked off the idea about mission control, the behind the scenes look at the church, the early church. We talked about the way of God. And we talked about uh, two things they did. Number one, they were obedient. They did exactly what the Lord had told them to do. And secondly, they were together. And we talked about the importance of being together as the body of Christ in three ways about the way they were together. They were together physically. And they're talking about being together as a church body. We talked about the importance of being together over the summertime together and not getting too disconnected. We all have to go our separate ways for vacation, things like that. But staying connected, we need to be together physically. It's important when somebody can pray over us and, and put their hands on us and see us and talk to us and share with us and pray with us. We need to be together physically. And only secondly, they were together purposefully, right? They were together with one mind, one heart together uh, in what God had called them to do. And that was to, to share the gospel of Christ with every person man, woman, boy, and girl, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And then lastly, they were together prayerfully. They, they prayed together. We're going to even touch back on that again together, but they prayed together. A church that prays together stays together. A family that prays together stays together, we often talk about. So when we talk about the way of God, we look at those first three verses together, but I want you to notice this last statement just to remind you of about prayer, that prayer, it maximizes he, talking about God, and minimizes me. 
right? I, I, I did a, a, new, a newsletter article this week. I don't know if you read it. If you didn't, I'd love you to go back and look at it. Or if you have time to go look at the Hubble Telescope website. And they have captured some of the most incredible images. Whether you like astronomy or not, it doesn't really matter. If you just want to look and realize how small you and I are in the grand scheme of things. We think we are so big. We don't, we don't maybe necessarily say that. But we think in our minds, perhaps now we live, that we're really big and important. Right? But in the grand scheme of things, some of the images I attach, one of these little square images about this big, this big, contain over 100,000 stars. 100,000 that was in the midst of this little small part of a small part of a teeny part of one little galaxy that contained like 20 million stars. I mean, talk about how great is our God. I mean, really. We need to be maximizing he and minimizing we, right? Prayer will do that for us. Keeps us grounded and focused. But we notice that not only did the disciples understand the way of God, and that was incredibly important, laid the foundation. The second thing they understood was some things about the word of God. About the word of God. In verses 15 to 22, let's go back and read this together and see what we're talking about. At the time... At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons were, was there together and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a God to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his portion in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language that field was called Hakaladama, that is the field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, let no man dwell in it, and his office let another man take. It is therefore necessary that of the men who have accompanied us in all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection." I want you to notice these early disciples found and followed the example of Christ. And that was this, as that the Word of God was incredibly important. You notice here for the disciples, they didn't have the New Testament at this point. There were no Gospels. There were no epistles of Paul or John or Peter yet. So they were a lot of the Scripture that they had, which was the Old Testament. In particular, the, the law, the Psalms. And the prophets, you would hear those three things talked about very often. And they relied on these as guidance. Jesus quoted the Old Testament on a regular basis. And they, no different, said, and we looked here, the office of a disciple has been vacated. So let's see what Scripture says in order for us to fill that thing, to fill that particular office. And so we notice in the scripture that everything they do is centered around what the Word of God told them. You see there, your Bible often highlights it, puts it in all caps or maybe in italicized, and maybe sets it apart in the rest of your scripture. It's quoting an Old Testament scripture. Now, I don't know what kind of Bible you have, but perhaps you have a Bible that has somewhere down the line in the middle of your Bible, maybe or at the bottom, a footnote, and it'll tell you where that scripture comes from because it's quoting from the Old Testament. The disciples believed that the Word of God would help them know the steps they needed to take. And it was not something they did when sometimes we get somewhere and going, man, I don't know what else to do. I guess I better go to the Word of God and figure it out. No, no. They went first to the Word of God. And they did that for four important reasons we believe to be the truth. Before I get those four reasons, let's just notice here where Peter quotes from Psalm 69, verse 25, as well as Psalm 109, verse number 8. In fact, he even says what David said. He quotes a psalm that King David had written to inform them to help shape the decisions that they were about to make. Notice four, uh, four things about their submission to the Word of God. They were submissive to the Word of God. And notice, the first one is, they considered the Word of God to be infallible. In other words, it was to be without error. Now, there is a move, and has been over the last 50 or 60 years, maybe longer than that, probably longer than that. In some of our seminaries, we saw it to be the case. And even some of our Baptist universities, there was this, this idea, and this even still exists today in some places, that the Word of God, though very important, 
Most, most Baptists, most biblical Christians would say the Bible is certainly important. But there are many who began to stop short of saying that it was infallible. That perhaps the Bible had mistakes in it. Perhaps the Bible maybe didn't get it all exactly correct. And we know and believe as part of this church family, and most of you would agree with this statement, we believe the Word of God to be without any error whatsoever. It is exactly what God intended for us to have. And not only do we believe that, the disciples believe that. The early church believed that to be the case because they went back and looked at it and used it as guidance for their life. Most of us agree that it is infallible. The, the real question for most of us is not that we agree that it is infallible, it has no error. If we really believe that to be true, how does that change our lives? How does that inform the way that we live? Because there's some verses we really like and we go, yep, 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 I like that verse. Right? I'll give an example just from Mother's Day. It's a great time. Wives, submit to your husbands. Boy, you hear that one. Men love to throw that one around a lot, right? But what they don't want to do is read the rest of the verse that says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Okay, well that sounds good, but you go read the rest of the context. What does that mean? It means that he's willing to give up his life for her. To sacrifice for her. Hey ladies, you get the better end of the deal. But how does that change who we are? We believe it's infallible. I believe it's true. But if I believe that it's true, dear church family, then it must show in how I live and the decisions I make and how I live my life. Not only do they consider it to be infallible, second, they consider it to be inspired. They considered it to be inspired. In other words, they believe the Holy Spirit had spoken to David and helped David pen those words written in the book of Psalms. So much so that not only did God have intentions for David in that time, in that time, but also as a prophecy for that which was to come, that it was inspired by God. God could see what they could not see, and that was far beyond that, that they would be come to a place they would need direction, and God gave them that direction in the Word of God, in the book of Psalms. David wrote it under the Holy Spirit's direction and guidance. Notice the third thing there, they considered it to be interpreted. They considered it to be interpretive. In other words, they helped them understand historical events and why they happened and how they happened and what they should do as a result of it. Peter says, David told us about Judas. He was numbered in our midst. He was part of us, but he abandoned us and betrayed Christ. Luke tells us the whole story here. Interpreting, guess what? Our world context through the lens of Scripture. This is really critical. Notice the disciples do not interpret the Word of God through their culture. Too often we take off our glasses, if you will, which are the Word of God, and look backwards at our situations and our circumstances. You see, the Word of God speaks to us, and sometimes we're so surprised, for example, when we are persecuted, maybe smallly, for our faith. Or we, Satan comes and opposes us or causes division in our home or in our church, and we're like, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, but if we go read the Word of God, it is interpreted. What do we know that is true? We're like shocked, and God's like going, are you kidding me? It says it right here in my Word. The problem sometimes comes, we can't interpret what's happening around us. Why? Because we don't really know what the Word of God says. We don't know how to talk to somebody who is in a, a different, uh, a, maybe a cult or a, 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 something that is a different religion than us. And we don't know how to talk to them. Why? Because we don't know the Word of God. And many, many times, many times they know the Word of God better than many Christians know the Word of God. And we have to understand that just like they did, constantly interpreting the events of our lives through the lens of Scripture. And so we see in our, in our day and time, we see more earthquakes and we see more famine. We see more heartache and we see destruction. We go, this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening, the world says. And we go, we know it's happening. We know it's interpreted, right? But the Bible says when we come towards the end of the days, you know, this world as we now know it, these things are going to happen. So we allow our scripture to inform how we are living and how we interpret the events of our world. Folks, I, I just have to tell you, our, our children, our students need to be taught to understand when they hit a college campus, they hit the workforce, that there is one God for them. And listen, it is not the preacher, 
or a life group leader, that the Word of God is their source and their guide. And it is the lens through which they have. We would call it this, a biblical world view. And when we talk about in our own home, about things that maybe they hear at school or they learn from somebody else, we go to the Word of God and say, listen, what does God's Word say? Do we worship the creation or do we worship the Creator? Do we place a high emphasis on the creation or do we place a high emphasis on the Creator? And why do we do that? We must have a biblical worldview. It was to be interpreted. Notice the fourth one, and that is this. They considered it to be instructive. They considered it to be instructive. What do we mean here? They say, Peter says, we need to find somebody else to take his place, Judas's place. So it is instructive to us on how we are to live our lives. The Word of God says this is what we should do. Therefore, we should do it. Here's our problem. We know what the Word of God says, but too often we like to rationalize or pretend or ignore or close our eyes or just forget that it's really there. And yet God's clear call to us is to have our eyes wide open to what the Word of God says to us, that it is infallible, that it is inspired, that it is interpreted, and that it is to be instructions in our lives to tell us where we are to go. Now, we don't know if Jesus told the disciples, hey guys, when I leave, you need to go elect on the disciple. It's not recorded in Scripture. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. But either way, whether Jesus told them or not, they go to the Word of God and figure out what should they do next. They don't go to a conference on how to select a great disciple. They don't get a consultant to come in and tell them, hey, you might want to try this or try that. What do they do? They go straight to the Word of God. That's what we should do, dear church family. Notice, Jesus had left them in some instructions, evidently about who qualified to be a disciple, or they, or they got it, they remembered what had happened and how they were chosen. There were three things about this aspect of the office of an apostle that are really important. Number one, that the office did exist. It did exist at this point. There were 12 of them, right? Christ had selected them early on in his ministry, right? At the beginning of the office you find in Mark chapter 3. Uh, you also find it was only 12 in Matthew chapter 19. And you're reading Revelation chapter 21, the Bible refers and, and refers to, John writes, about the 12 apostles, right? There will be the names of the 12 apostles and the 12 uh, gates that would be in the city of heaven. So there were only 12 apostles, right? There was a beginning of the office and there is an end of the office. Notice the second thing, there were qualifications of what was to happen. What does he say here in Scripture? They had to have been with Jesus from the very beginning all the way through his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension. Those were qualifications they understood to be based on Scripture. Now, what we understand is the office ceased to exist at that point. Why? After this point, they come later after these apostles had died, there were no other people that would have met these qualifications. So the, the idea of an apostle was only 12. It ended with these 12 apostles. Now again, the responsibilities were, they were, I love this, eyewitnesses, original eyewitnesses of Christ. Now, some would say, well, what about the Apostle Paul? He calls himself an apostle, yet if you go ahead and read, he calls himself a unique apostle. He's not the same as the 12. He was called later, right? And he was an apostle in a sense because he was an eyewitness to Christ. It evidently indicates that he had to have seen a lot of things that happened to Jesus. But he was different than the 12. And so he's not named among the 12 apostles. We see this office really spread then into the office of a pastor, teacher, evangelist that happens in Scripture. You can see in Ephesians chapter 2 and in chapter number 4. So we see the apostles in these early days, the early church, mission control, right? Looking behind the scenes, what made it tick? What decisions did they make in order to see this launch of the church take place? Here's what it was. They believed in the way of God. They were together. They were obedient. They were together physically. They were together purposefully. They were together prayerfully. Secondly, they, they believed the Word of God was instructive. It was infallible, right? It was inspired and it was to be interpreted in their lives, in the church, and how they were to live. The third thing we notice is the will of God. We talk about the will of God. The question, very, very interesting at the very beginning, is this. And that is, who was going to be the next disciple? How were they to choose them. Well, we see how they were to choose them, but who was that person to be? 
You talk about the will of God, man, there are so many struggles on this issue. People oftentimes ask, and I remember as a young teenager asking my dad, how do I know it's the will of God? And I'll be honest with you, I even struggled knowing whether it was God's will to come here. Is it God's will for me to come here? Because there were lots of things that said yes, and lots of things that said no. Lots of things that said yes. Lots of things that said no. A lot of things in my flesh said no. A lot of things in my spirit said yes. What wins out? What, how do you know what to do? How do you know what job to take? How do you know who to marry? Who do you date? How many children do you have? Where do you live? What kind of house do you buy? What kind of cars do you have? Do you go on this mission trip? Do you not? Do you go to this school? Do you not? Well, how do we know what the will of God is? There's so many things that are being taught that are not really legitimate principles of the Word of God. And yet we see here in this decision-making process, we see about the will of God. Even everyday day decisions about our lives fall under the category of what is the will of God for your life. Because we believe, I think most of us in the room would say, that God has a plan for my life. I think most of us that are believers would say, well, yes, of course that's the case. That's no-brainer, Right? But the will of God is different for each of us because of who we are and the plans that he has for us. Now, some of our plans come together because we're part of our will of God is for us to be a part of this church family, right? So part of our, our paths of our lives, our journey, they come together here at Pedal First Baptist and maybe even other places. But we have to be very careful about drawing out principles and grabbing a scripture and saying, oh, that one verse says, yes, I must go. I didn't look for a verse in Psalms that says, Thou shalt open the rose petal and go. Oh, there's a the verse. I should go to petal, right? No, right? But there are people who will do that. They'll yank a verse out and say, Oh, well, God said this verse and this is what I should do. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't speak, right? And there are times, you know, and I didn't do this and go, All right, God, should I go? Should I not? When they sin against thee, for there is no man who does not sin in 2 Chronicles, doesn't help me, does it? Right? But that's sometimes how we act. Sometimes the will of God, open the word of God, say, oh God, here we go. Any, many, mighty, mo. Here's a verse, right? That's not what we're talking about when we find the will of God. We have to be careful. Not everything is prescriptive in Scripture, but some of it is descriptive, if you will. Now, there were some unknowns here, right? Jesus had evidently told him about the office, the qualifications of the office, but he had not told them who needed to fill the office, the specific person. So what were they to do? Same things for us. What are we to do? Which of two jobs do I take? Who am I to marry? There's no answers you're going to find to tell you you should marry. Now, there were times I thought that it would be great. Have you ever thought it before? It would be great if I just came across a verse that says, Thou shalt marry Rebecca. Right? I could have gone and read the story of Isaac and maybe I would have gotten it. So if it was spelled wrong, maybe I could have gotten it and then I should marry Rebecca. Right? But I'm not, my name's not Isaac. Not even close. So that doesn't really meet my needs, right? Should I come to this place or go to that place? Where did I go to college? How People say, well, how do you know? I used to ask my dad that question many times. I remember I was struggling with my call to ministry. Did God call me to be a preacher? Did he not? I don't know. I was in, in, in high school and my dad would say, son, if you will stay in the word of God, if you will pray, if you will listen to counsel of people, if you will seek God, he said, I promise you, you will know in your spirit and your heart of hearts where you're supposed to be. I'd be like, yeah, but dad, that just doesn't answer my question. How do you know? You'll just know. And you know what? He was right. Now, we, got, we can't just say in our hearts and go, okay, let me think about it. Yep. Yep, it's, it's God's will. I feel it. And the problem is some of us are really already hungry at 1120. We're already thinking about lunch already, Mother's Day lunch, right? And we make a decision on the empty stomach, and we shouldn't. You know, because we're not, that wasn't the will of God, right? I, I, I would have teenagers from time to time to come and say, oh, God has called me to be this or that. Maybe a missionary or preacher. How long have you prayed about that? Man, I felt God calling me right over there by the campfire. And what you have to eat for supper? Baked beans and a hot dog? You ever thought about that? Could be a little gas. It may not be the Holy Spirit, you know? You might want to pray that a little longer than around a campfire singing Kumbaya. Okay, you get the idea here. Right? That's somehow we, sometimes how we treat the Word of God, though. We think, I just can make a decision. Bam, there it is. And we never, we've never sought God on it. We've never prayed. We never sought the heart of God. My dad used to make me so mad. I would just want to strangle him. Make me so mad. I'd, say, I'd call him up and say, Dad, I'm facing this difficult situation. What do you think I ought to do? Every time, without fail. Well, Brad, how long have you prayed about it? Dad, that's not what I called to ask you. 
I didn't need you to ask me a question. I want you to help me find the answer. He said, I'll be glad to talk to you when you can call me back and tell me you've spent hours in prayer and in the Word of God. Then call me back. Oh, my. He was right. Now, nine times out of ten, I'd go back, I'd pray, I'd start call him back, and he'd say, well, what'd you find out? You need any help me more? I said, no, sir. <laughs> no, not no. Let's be clear about that. No, sir. What did he know? We can sometimes find God's will by asking other people because we can get people to agree with us, right? There were people in my life who said to me, oh, Brad, I could really see God's hand on your life. I could see God using you in that way. But that doesn't mean that's God's call because 20 people tell me that. I have to know that God has told me that, right? You need to know God has directed you in that way. So we have to know how are we to find those specific answers, the situation where it's not clear. Here's what we do. And notice what the disciples did. We do the same thing. Number one, notice this. They engaged in sacrificial prayer. Yep, we're coming back to that one again. They engaged in sacrificial prayer. Verse 14 says, they, 14 says they were continually devoted to praying. Where most of us break down when seeking the word of God is, really the truth is we've not really prayed enough about it. And praying five minutes or praying one day or one week about the will of God in our lives is usually not enough. Now, we're not talking about, by the way, situations where we think, well, I don't know if I should witness or not if that's the will of God. Well, let me help you real clearly in case you don't know. I can already give you a great straight answer about that one. You don't have to pray about it. It is the will of God. Okay? Right? Right? I don't know if I should tithe or not, if that's God's will. Let me help you. It's prescriptive. It's right there. You should tithe. I don't know if I should go to church. You should. It's in the Word of God. There are things and principles that are crystal clear. But there are situations, if he had to write it about all of us together, think about how big the Bible would be if he had to write out word for word for every one of us. We'd have to all have our own copy, right? That would be different. To line it out like that. It doesn't work that way, right? And so he gives us principles from the Word of God we can apply to our situations and see where God is calling us to do. And the first one is we have to engage in sacrificial prayer. You can't follow the other principles we're going to talk about unless, unless you engage in prayer with God. It'll be much easier to answer the question of what the will of God is for a specific situation than it is to become a woman or a man of prayer. You know, a lot of times God's design for us is why he doesn't make it crystal clear sometimes on the very front side. Not because God's playing cosmic hide and go seek with you. Not, here's why. Because sometimes all God really wants out of us in this situation is for us to get closer to him. And the more we need to see the will of God in our lives, the closer we get, the more we talk to him, the more we pray. Oh God, I don't know what to do. Oh God, help me. Oh God, I don't know. My prayer life was pretty decent, I guess, before we came here. But boy, it went get kicked into high gear. Now, I know the search committee is wishing it had kicked into higher gear earlier, I guess, or sooner or harder. But it kicked into high gear. Lord, I don't know what to do. This, this looks like this. My flesh says this. My spirit says this. The circumstances look like this. I've got to pray. When's the last time you and I have engaged in sacrificial prayer? Jesus prayed all night long and chose his disciples in 10 minutes. Most of the time, we pray for 10 minutes and choose all night long. That's typically how it works. We pray. We pray. What is sacrificial prayer? What is it? It costs us something. It's an inconvenience for us. We skip a lunch and we pray and we fast. I want to ask you a question. Have you been praying for your family, for your spouse this week, for your children? Have you prayed with them? Have you been praying for our church family, for the Vision 2020? Have you been praying about a place for us to have a back your Bible club? Have you been praying for God's direction and God's blessing, God's unity on this church family? Have you been praying sacrificially? We must pray sacrificially. And notice the second thing. Not only did they pray sacrificially, they did first and foremost, secondly, they got all the information. They got all the information they needed. This is very important, Right? When I, when I was coming to Pedal First Baptist, was it God's will or not? I got a lot of information. I talked to different people. Ask about people, ask about the church. I found as many people I could to ask about. I probably should talk more close about some of the search committee members, ask some better questions about some of them. I don't know. They're kind of crazy people, but um, no, I'm kidding. All except Chris Rhodes. They're all crazy. Or he's crazy and they're not. I guess that's a better way to say it, right? If y'all awake or have y'all gone completely asleep on me? That was supposed to be incredibly funny. The search committee even smiled at me. It's good. 
right? We, we get, we're gathering information, right? So I was asking them all kind of questions. What about this? And what about this? And what about this? And some of those they had answers for, and some they didn't, right? So I gathered information. You need to gather information about the situation that you find yourself in. Gather all the information you can. That's what the disciples did. They find out who met the qualifications. Who meets the qualifications to be an apostle, right? And they found two men, Right? Look, look at who was there. See who meets the criteria to fill the position itself. You got to do your homework, right? Got to use our head that God has given us. And not just sit on the doorstep and say, well, you know, if the search committee just said, well, God will just put a preacher on our doorstep. We're just going to sit right here and wait on God. Guess what, search committee? You still be looking for a preacher. Because preachers don't come around on the doorstep and say, hey, I'm, I'm here to be your preacher. And if they do, that's probably not the one you need to have, probably, if that's the case, right? So we know that's not the way that it works, right? You've got to be proactive. You've got to gather information. For example, you're going to marry somebody. Let's make it really clear. What do you do? You, be, you begin to find out things about them, right? You begin to know them. What is their character like now, their integrity now, their walk with God now? You're finding information. How do they qualify now? Not, watch this now, not what will they become. I, I can't tell you the people that have sat in my office and said, I thought and I wish and I hope when I married them that they'd become this man or this woman. And my challenge to you, talking about the will of God to find out who to marry, is this. You find out who they are now in God and who God will grow them to become. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you. It, don't do the missionary dating. Right? It doesn't work very often. It works on occasions, but by and large, listen, ladies, if he's not getting them going to church now, guess what he's not going to do in 10 years? Get up and go to church. Well, he'll love me enough he'll want to. He will for the first year. And he'll go for the second year because you're nagging. By the third year, he's going to go la, 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 la. Look, I'm just speaking truth to you. I've seen it happen. Didn't, didn't do the research, didn't do your homework, didn't really find out who they really were. Find out the qualifications, right? Got all the information. Thirdly, notice this, they trusted in God's sovereignty. They trusted in God's sovereignty. Their theme is this, and Stephen Curtis Chapman sings this song, put it to words, to, to music. God is God and I am not. Isn't that a great statement? I love that. We know that on the surface, but sometimes we live our lives as if we are God. That God doesn't have this grand plan, this sovereign plan that is unfolding before us. That we can trust Him and rely on Him that the sovereign God whom has created heaven and earth and put these billions and billions and quadzillions of stars and named every one of them, by the way. If that same God can do that and put our earth in order, put a sun that's exploding all the time, this God has created this incredible human body that we live in, this incredible creation that we get to enjoy, if he can do that, then is he not sovereignly in control of your life and mine? See, disciples believe that, that God was in control. And so they're going to find this disciple. It's not God. Who do we want? It's God. Watch this. Who have you already chosen? God, show us who that person is. I believe with all my heart that God had chosen before I ever was born, Rebecca to be my wife. And my prayer was, and should have been earlier, maybe I didn't pray it quick enough and early enough since we didn't get married until I was 30. Maybe I was asleep or something, I don't know. But, but my prayer is, God, you've already sh you already have her picked out for me, the perfect one for me. God, show me who she is. Show me. You've got the perfect job picked out for me. You've got the next move for me, Lord. Show me where it is, Lord, just so I can walk in where you want me to walk. It's that experiencing God principle. We see where God is at work and we join Him there. We don't go and run off into the, the wild beyond yonder. We trust in the information which God has given us and His sovereignty. Charles Rowry says, They prayed not for the Lord to choose, but for the choice which the Lord had already been made to be made known to them. Notice, they acknowledge the sovereignty of God when they prayed. They said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. They acknowledge God's sovereignty when they pray. And also notice this, the realization for the Christian is the reality that the decisions that we make in life are really not our decisions, but his decisions. Our, our goal in life is to find out, God, what is your heart? What is your mind? What is your will for my life? To find that and walk in that. So the disciples are praying, Lord, let us know what you've already decided. Lord, give us direction. 
We want to pray that. Lord, give me direction. Or do we pray, Lord, let us know what heaven has already decided. And notice how they figured out how to use this one. Now, this one, this one kind of blows our mind. When I very first read it years ago and began to really understand, I just kind of read it in a cursory glance and thought, this is kind of weird. Right? How are they going to pick between? Because they got two guys, right? The Bible identifies two guys. And, and they get what's called casting lots. They get a cup of some kind. They put two rocks in it, right? Right? One guy's name on the other guy's name. They shake it around and they put out the cup. Now, on a first cursory glance, you read that. I'm like, man, that sounds like pennies against a wall game or something. Or, you know, here we go. Disciple A or disciple B. Heads is Matthias. And B, I think the other guy's name. Um, I lost it. Joseph called Barsabbas. Right? So Joseph or Matthias. Ready? Heads or tails? Flip it. Go, God. Right? Now, we think to our minds, oh, that's what I need to do. So do I go or do I stay? Date person A or B. A is this, B is God. Flip. Oh, it must be God's will, right? Is that what this means here? No. Now, were they in line with what was Scripture then? Yes. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, right? Proverbs 16, 33 gave them information on what they were to do in this instance. Let me read it to you quickly. Proverbs 16, verse 33. Here's what it says. Grab there a minute. The lot is cast into the lap. Watch this. But it's every decision is from the Lord. They believed wholeheartedly that God would literally control the direction of those two stones and the right one would show them what they were to do and who they were to choose. Now notice, if you notice in Scripture, this never occurs again in Scripture. Never. There's no casting lots. You look at, we'll look in Acts chapter 5. They choose seven deacons. They do not cast lots for them. Why? One reason. Watch this. The Holy Spirit of God had come. And the Holy Spirit of God is able to inform our hearts and our mind and our spirit through the Word of God and through praying. God is able to speak to us. We don't have to have lots. God can speak to us through His Word and through praying. So in that moment, that process ended in Acts chapter 1. It was never, ever used again. Much to be said about that. But in, 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 in Acts chapter 5, they choose the deacons, right? What happens? There was some sort of a voting process. We don't know exactly how it occurred, but there was no casting of lots, and they chose these seven men. So they believe in God's sovereignty. Now, in that same breath, as we get close to the end here, notice sometimes you hear people say, well, I guess that was just God's will. As if to blame something on God. Right? We have to be very careful. A guy was killed in an auto accident and said, oh, well, it's God's will. Well, when you come to find out the circumstances, the guy that had been driving had been driving intoxicated and has wrapped his tree, his car around a tree. They find a wife, stayed in the hospital, lived for 12 days and passed away. And at his funeral, somebody said it was God's will. Can I just give you a fresh word? That is not God's will. That was not God's will for that man. That man made a poor decision that cost him his life. So let's not blame God when our life goes awry, when we've made poor decisions and we've not sought God's will and followed his heart and his plan for our life. Is it tragic? Yes. Is it sad? Yes. But that was not God's will. Can God work something beautiful out of it? Yes. It's a God we serve. We can trust him. Notice the fourth thing. Notice the fourth thing in the last, the last two. Notice this. First of all, they made sure their hearts were right. What do you mean by that? I believe the disciples, they were praying. They were together. They made certain their hearts were in line with God. There was no sin in their life. They were as close to God as they could possibly be. There was no bargaining with God. Well, God, I'll do this if you'll do this, Right? Lord, if you'll answer my prayer. We used to be this prayer a long time ago. Nobody prays anymore for some reason. Lord, if you'll answer my prayer, I'll go to Africa and be a missionary. For the rest of my life. Lord, Lord, I'll, I'll be a nun forever if you'll just do this. Lord, I'll do, I'll, we start bargaining with God. 
And he'll show us what we need to do or he'll answer our prayer. And what does God say? No, no, I get my heart right with him, in line with him, praying the thing. He says, Lord, let me pray what you want me to do. Let me be and be and where you want me to be. Well, disciples could pray. They had to make sure their hearts were right. They would select the right person. Notice the last one. They made a decision. And they went with it. I missed it. Psalm 37, didn't I, Michael? I'm trying to find out where that is because I don't want to miss that. Oh, that's at the very end. No, notice, they made a decision, they went with it. The lot falls to Matthias, they choose the guy. And you don't hear anything else about the other guy. Nothing about Joseph or Sabbath except what you hear in tradition. It goes with Matthias, this is what the will of God is, we roll with it. Nobody came up later when Paul came on the scene of Acts chapter 8 and thinking, oh man, we blew it, we should have waited for Paul. You don't read that in Scripture. Why? Because that was not God's plan. That was not God's sovereign plan for Paul in that moment. They were confident in the decision they had made. And how could they be so confident? Why? They had prayed sacrificially. They'd gotten all the information they could. They had trusted in God's sovereignty. They made sure their hearts were right. And when we make that decision, then we move ahead in faith. And we don't have to worry or look back and guess and say, Oh, I don't know, should I have done this or not? Folks, God will confirm it. I'm telling you, God will confirm it. I, I can look at my own life over many instances of my life, but let me just tell you the most recent one. I knew God confirmed in some great ways and in some terrible ways that God wanted me as pastor of Petal First Baptist Church. We saw almost instantaneously God begin to birth something new and wonderful here. By the time we rolled from May to August, God had already added 30 or 40 people already. People had begun to come. People had begun to respond. The offerings began to pick up. God began to birth something new and powerful and wonderful. And it was a confirmation. This is where God, and I needed that because I longed for my old church family and the friends that we had and all the leaving of all that behind. I'd known something for 20 years. It was hard. Now, it's three years later. It's a lot easier because I know some of you are my friends and I can count on you and call you and you can pray with me and we've walked through some journeys together. But at that point, I didn't know any of you except for, for nine or seven search committee members. I didn't know them really well either. So God confirmed it in some amazing ways. But two weeks after I stood in this pulpit, by the way, I just thought about it. Three years ago on Mother's Day was my first day here. I just thought about that. It's hard to believe. Three years ago. But on March 25th, I preached that message. And on April the 16th, three weeks later, I, went for, I left here on March 25th. I went to my parents' house. It's the last time I ever saw my dad healthy. Ever. Went to eat. We got a picture of him with the Cock of the Walk restaurant there and on the reservoir with my family, my younger brother's family. Last time I saw him healthy. April 16th, I stood at Baptist Hospital and I sat in that waiting room and I watched the doctor walk out five minutes, ten minutes after they started the procedure and came straight out and looked at me and he said, we got to put a port in. And in that instant, I mean, I knew it. it was, there was no like, I just don't know. I knew in an instant. I didn't know the journey we were about to face, but I knew and God had confirmed this is exactly where I was supposed to be. And guess what? Ultimately, it had nothing to do with you. Y'all just the sugar on top. That's what y'all are. You the gravy on the mashed potatoes. The gravy on the biscuit, right? Because my, my God knew my God knew he didn't give my dad cancer. My God knew that my dad had cancer. And even orchestrating before I was ever born to put me right here so I could walk with my mom through the valley of the shadow of death and be close enough to her to do that and for a church to be gracious enough to let me do that. God will confirm in your heart what it was right to do. So when you've walked these steps... You walk ahead in faith and confidence that God has called you to do it. Why do we know that? What does Scripture tell us? Psalm 37 verse 4, 5 says this. My daddy used to tell me this verse all the time. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to Him. Trust also in Him and He will do it. Now we know in Matthew, we kind of put this verse together in the book of Matthew in the, in the, in the Gospels. It says, what does it say? Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be open unto you. And there's some preachers who preach around here and say, ask, seek, and knock. Well, I'm going to ask God for a million dollars. I'm going to ask God for a new house or a new car, a new airplane, whatever it is. I'm going to ask God for that. Is that what this means? 
No, because what, my dad knows he's talked about this verse before because you put the two of these together. And if I'm delighting myself in the Lord, do you know what I'm going to want? Don't miss this. You know what I'm going to want? I'm going to want what God wants. Not what I want. Because what I want is a lot of stuff that will not last and will burn up at the end. But if I connect my heart to God's heart and God's will and God's sovereign plan, I will pray what that, that God would want. And here's the kicker. When I pray that, then it will delight my heart. Because what I think will delight my heart is what I want. But what I really know will delight my heart is what God wants. And so when I want what God wants, God will delight my heart in it. And I can trust in Him and He will do it. You get that? Is that not a good word? And so our prayers be, God, help me to pray the kind of prayer that says, God, let my heart want what your heart wants. Oh, man, our time is up. Goodness gracious, I know we've got to hurry. Beat the Methodist. I've got to hurry. I'm going to say this last word. What, what is God's heart? God's heart is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That we would go into all the world, starting right here and to the ends of the earth and all the places in between and share the love of Christ. To be a church that God has called us to be that is dynamic and alive and well and purposefully together and physically together and praying together and searching God's heart together and then sharing the love of Christ with every person we can. That's God's heart. The question is this, do we have God's heart? Notice this last statement. God's desire is for us that we would seek His way to search His Word and to select His will far above anything else. God's desire is for us that we would seek His way to search His Word and to select His will far above anything else. May we make that our prayer this morning. Let's pray together.